Welcome back. This is JavaScript Fundamentals 201 Lesson 9, Ajax. It's a pretty cool little technology that's been around since the early 2000s. It was called remote scripting then, and it wasn't until 2005 that we actually got a name, Ajax. That's when the term was coined, and it was an acronym for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And you can still use it as an acronym today, but we typically don't. It's just AJAX. Uh, if we want to describe the technology of using JavaScript to make an HTTP request to the server and then do something with the server's response, we call that AJAX. Now, the X stood for XML, and that was the data format that we used to send and receive information. And we can still use XML, but we typically don't anymore because there's a lighter weight format called JSON, which we will talk about in the next lesson. But it's really easy for me to describe what AJAX is, but you'll get a better understanding of what it is and what it can do with an actual demonstration. So I'm going to go to google.com. And you've probably experienced this before, but I'm going to explain to you what's going on as you start typing. So I'm going to start typing JavaScript. And right off the bat, we can see a few things. One, the whole page changed. And that's, you know, that's not really important as far as Ajax is concerned until we start seeing results. But the suggestions are coming from Google's servers via Ajax. Every time we press a key, it's sending a request to Google servers for a list of suggestions. And the server sends those information back to the JavaScript engine that called that request. And then it processes the information. And then that's how we get these suggestions. So as we keep typing, I'm going to type the word fundamentals, we can see that we are not only getting suggestions, but we are also getting results. Everything that we are seeing here is a result of Ajax. The JavaScript is sending a request to the server. It's getting some suggestions as well as search results based upon what we type within our text box. So I'll finish out fundamentals. We'll see that the suggestions change as well as the results that we get. And this is what Ajax does. It allows us to write software with a better experience for the user. Because let's think about what Google was before instant search. Well, we had to type text into the text box and then we click the search button and then we waited for our query to get back from Google servers for the listing of all of our results. Now, all we have to do is just start typing in the text box and Ajax does the rest for us. It gives us the suggestions that we want. It gives us the results that we want. That's just what Ajax does. It's used to give the users a better experience. Okay, so before we move on, there's one thing that you absolutely need for this lesson and for the next lesson, and that is a web server. It doesn't have to be on the internet. It doesn't have to be on your network. It can be on your local machine, but you have to have a web server because Ajax is using JavaScript to make HTTP requests. Therefore, all of the pages Pages, all of the JavaScript, everything has to be served from a web server. So if you don't have one installed on your computer, you need to get one installed for this lesson. I am going to use WebMatrix. In fact, this is why I picked WebMatrix, because it has a built-in web server. It's called IIS Express, which is a trimmed down version of Microsoft's full-blown IIS web server software. If you have uh, a professional version of Windows or above, you can install the full-blown version of IIS if you want to use that. Uh, if you are not on Windows or if you don't want to use WebMatrix or IIS, you can use Apache. It is open source and it is the most popular web server software on the planet, so you can't go wrong there. Uh, we are not going to install Apache in this lesson. Uh, there are plenty of tutorials online that you can find to download and install Apache on your computer. So it really doesn't matter what web server you use, as long as you use one that you're comfortable with and it serves web pages. At the heart of Ajax is an object called XML HTTP request. And don't let this XML fool you. Even though it's in its name, you can request just about anything that you want using this object. It's just that XML was the de facto format for 
data transfer whenever this was created. And this was actually invented by Microsoft, except it was called XML HTTP. It was an ActiveX object that you could use in your JavaScript. And then Firefox came along and basically copied XML HTTP and called it XML HTTP request. And that was a very good thing because then every other browser incorporated the XML HTTP request object. So Opera did, and then whenever Chrome came along, it too incorporated XML HTTP request. So to create one of these objects, all we have to do is call the constructor new XML HTTP request, and then that's it. Now, I'm not going to refer to this as XML HTTP request unless if I'm specifying the constructor name. I'm just going to call it XHR because that's a whole lot easier to say. This code works in every browser except IE6. In IE6, we would have to create the ActiveX objects of XML HTTP, and we would also have to know the version number of each of those objects because there's several different versions of XML HTTP. So to create one of these objects in IE6, we have to go through a whole lot of rigmarole. And frankly, I don't want to do that. One, because it's a lot of work. Two, because IE6 is dying. And three, because we want IE6 to die. So if we all start coding for uh, not IE6, the sooner that it will hopefully die. So we're not going to cover IE6 in this course. So the first step in making a request is, of course, to create this XHR object. The second step is to call a method called open. And we need to specify three arguments. The first is the request type. In this case, I'm going to use a get request. We can also use post if we were sending information to the server, but uh, we are just going to use get because we are just making a get request. Most requests that you use on the internet is a get request. Anytime you type in a URL inside of your browser's address bar, that is making a get request. So we are going to use get. The second argument is the URL that we want to request. In this case, I'm going to request this text file.txt. It's just a simple text file that resides on the server. In fact, that's what its text says. So we are going to get the contents of this file and then alert it in an alert window. And the third argument is a Boolean value. If it's true, then we use asynchronous mode. And that's the mode that we typically want to use. But for this example, we are going to use false. This is going to put our XHR object into synchronous mode. And I'll tell you what the difference is between these two modes here in a moment. The third and final step is to send the request. If we were making a post request, we would specify the data that we want to send with that post request with this send method. But since we are making a get request, we simply want to pass null. So we will do that. And then whenever our request is completed, then we can use the data from that request. Well, to do that, we use a response text property. There's also a response XML property that if the data is XML, then this would be an actual DOM object of the XML file. But in this case, we want just the text. So we will alert that. So let's add alert and XHR dot response text. Let's look at our HTML to make sure our script files are in there. That is looking good. We don't need our event utility right now, but that's okay. I already have this open in a browser, so let's refresh. And we can see that we are getting the contents of that file. This is a text file residing on the server. So using the XHR object, we have made a request for this text file, gotten its contents, and then displayed its contents within an alert window. So congratulations, you just wrote your first Ajax script. But it's not the traditional Ajax that we use, primarily because we used synchronous mode as opposed to asynchronous mode. Well, what's the difference? Synchronous mode blocks the browser from doing things. Whenever we make a synchronous request, the browser stops. It does nothing. It waits for that request to finish. So it sends the request, it waits for the server to send a response, and then code execution begins. So there's so many other things that the browser could be doing, but it can't because we are using synchronous mode. With asynchronous mode, 
the XHR object sends its request, but then the browser can keep doing things. So it can load the rest of the page, or it can execute other JavaScript code, or it can do whatever it wants to. Uh, the point is that with asynchronous mode, the browser can do something. So we typically want to use asynchronous mode because that way the user isn't left there sitting looking at a browser that's just waiting for something to happen. Instead, it's doing whatever it needs to do. So instead of specifying false, we need to specify true for asynchronous. But this brings its own set of problems because one of the nice things with synchronous mode is that we can write code sequentially because we open, we send, and then the browser stops and waits for a response. So then we know that we have a response there waiting for us. With asynchronous mode, we can't really rely upon the order of execution because we could send the request, but we might not have a response at line seven we might get that response whenever our code is executing at line 100, for example. Well, asynchronous requests go through five different stages called ready state. There's a property called ready state, and it changes value based upon what stage the request is going through. It starts at zero and it ends at four. The fourth is really the only ready state that we care about because that means that the request was sent and we have a complete response from the server ready to go. And every time the ready state property changes value, a ready state change event occurs. So we can handle this ready state change event and that way we can find out when we have a response from the server and then do something with that response. So let's do that. Let's handle the ready state change event. So we will do xhr dot on ready state change and we are using a dom level zero event handler uh, in the first javascript fundamentals course i said that we typically don't want to do that but with xhr objects that's usually fine so we will do that here we'll specify the function and then inside of this function we want to check the ready state property so let's do xhr dot ready state equals four if that is the case, then we want to alert xhr.response text. And let's comment out line 14. Let's go back to the browser, refresh, and we will see that our code still works. This is a text file residing on the server. Now I want to uncomment line 14 because I want to demonstrate asynchronous requests for you. As our code is currently written, we call open, we set up the on ready state change event handler, and then we send the request. Well, since this is an asynchronous request, code execution continues as normal. So right after line 11 executes, we execute line 14. So the problem here is we are executing line 14, hopefully before we get a value for response text because the XHR object hopefully will not have received a response from the server. I say hopefully because this is a local web server. So requests are going to go very fast. So we could send the request on line 11 and we might actually have a response ready by line 14. Hopefully we won't, but the chance is still there. So let's put something here so that we can uh, show you the difference between 14 and seven. So let's just do, this is outside of event handler. That's perfect. So hopefully we will see, I'm refreshing, we see the this is outside of the event handler. If this text was not here, then we would have nothing inside of this alert box, which would be fine because we are calling uh, the response text property before we have a value. And whenever we click OK, we will have a response from the server and then we are seeing the contents of that file. So hopefully you get a better idea of what asynchronous requests look like with that little demonstration. Checking the ready state property is something that we need to do, but we also need to check another property called status. It's xhr dot status. This gives us the HTTP response status code from the server. This basically tells us whether or not we have the response that we want, or if the server couldn't find our requested file, or the server encountered an error while trying to serve the response. So the status code of 404 
means that the server could not find whatever it was that we requested. 500 is that it encountered an error, but there is a set of codes that means that everything is okay. It ranges from 200 to 299, so we need to check to see if the status property is within this range. There's also another value of 304, which also means that everything is okay, but that it hasn't changed since the last time that we requested it. So we also need to take that into account. So first, let's create a variable called status, and we will do xhr.status. This is going to get our status code, and then we need to check the ranges. So if status is greater than or equal to 200, and if it is less than 300, then we know that we have an okay uh, response. And we need to group that together because we are checking the range of status. And then we need to check the value of 304. So status equals 304. And if that is the case, if it's within the range or if it's equal to 304, then we know we have good response data to work with, so we will alert that. Otherwise, we will just tell the user that something bad happened because something did bad happen. And let's run this within the browser. We will see we are getting the contents of our text file, but let's change the URL that we are requesting. Instead of textfile.txt, we will request textfile2.txt. This does not exist, so we will get a status code of 404, which we will see the text, something bad happened inside of the alert window. There we go, something bad happened. So this is the basis of Ajax. We create an XHR object, we open it, we specify the request type, get, post, whatever. Uh, then we specify the URL and true for asynchronous mode. We then use the on ready state change event handler to check for the ready state. We also check for the request status. And then finally we send the request. That's a lot of code, but it does allow us a lot of flexibility. And if you do any development using Microsoft technologies, you can really tell that this was created by Microsoft, but that's neither here nor there. Let's now look at how we can use the XHR object with post requests. And as far as our JavaScript is concerned, there's not a whole lot of differences between making a get and making a post request. Our on ready state change event handler is going to stay the same. We do need to specify a header whenever we send our request, and we also need to actually send data whenever we call the send method. But we'll get to that first because we need to assemble all of the data that we want to send with our request. So I'm going to modify our index.html file. I'm pasting in a simple form. It has a name and email fields. It also has a submit button. That means we will also have to handle the submit event because if we don't and we click the submit button, then the form is going to be submitted normally. We want to do so using Ajax. And also notice that there is nothing set for the action because we're not actually going to send the data someplace uh, that's actually useful. Uh, I wanted to keep this as simple as possible to keep you from having to install as many things as possible. So this would be where we could put in some PHP or ASP.NET or Ruby or any other server-side application that we would want. So let's go back to our script file. We need to write a function to assemble all of the data from our form. We only have two text fields, so that's going to be rather easy to do, but we also need to retrieve the submit button as well. So I'm going to create a function called get request body. And this is going to look at our form and build a string in the proper format for sending it in uh, our send method. So let's finish off this function creation. So We'll do equals function. And then inside of this function, we need to get a reference of the form. So let's do var the, well, we'll just call it form document dot get elements by ID. We'll specify the form. 
And next, we need to loop through all of the elements within the form. Now, if you remember from the previous lesson, I mentioned that there is an elements property that a form object has, and it contains all of the form control elements within that form. So we can use that. Let's use a for loop so that we will loop through every element. We'll have a counter called i. And then let's also create a variable called L to have the length of those elements. So we will do form.elements.length. We will loop as long as I is less than L. And then we will increment our counter by I equals I plus 1. And then inside of this loop, let's first make things easier for us to type. We will get form.elements at index I and assign it to this L variable so that now we can just use L whenever we need the element object that we are currently working with. Now, since we are sending form data, we need to format it in a way that the server expects. And that is in a format that looks very similar to the query portion of a GET request. In fact, they are pretty much identical in that we have a field name followed by an equal sign and then a value for that field name. And then if we have another name value pair, we separate that with an ampersand, and then name equals value, and so on and so forth. Well, that's really easy for us to do because we have the form control element objects. All we have to do is get their names and get their values, join them together with an equal sign, and then at the end, make sure that we have each of those pieces separated with an ampersand. So let's take this one step at a time, and let's create two variables here. So let's do name equals L dot name, easy, and let's do value equals L dot value. And then let's create yet another variable. Uh, let's call this one complete, and we will do name equals value. Now, this isn't really sufficient because we do need to encode the name and the value so that they can be passed in uh, a URL. Now, we're not actually going to pass this information in a URL, but they have to be encoded as if they were going to be passed within a URL because, well, that's just what is required. So there is a built-in function that we can use called encode URI component. And that will encode all of these special characters that need to be encoded. Let's just copy and paste that again for the value. So now we have complete and we need to keep track of all of these name value pairs. So let's create another variable outside of our loop. Let's call this values and we will make this an array so that inside of our loop, we simply do values dot push complete. So at the end of our function, we will simply return values and then join because we want to convert all of this to a string, each of the elements within the values array separated by an ampersand. So that should work. Now all we need to do is test all of this, but we need to do so within the submit event handler. So we need to make some changes. First, let's set up an event handler for the submit uh, event. So let's do event utility dot add event, but we do need the form object. Well, we have that inside of get request body. So I'm going to be lazy, cut that out. And we need to save our values there. Let's make our form the first line. We also need to change the final character to a semicolon because that is the end of that statement. Now I'm doing all of this within the global scope, which is a no, no. Uh, normally we would put this inside of an immediately invoked function, but uh, for the sake of not having a bunch of extra code, since we have a ton of code already, uh, we're just going to do everything within the global scope. Okay. So the first thing is the form. Next, we want to handle the submit event and then 
we want our function to execute whenever that event occurs. So whenever this does occur, first thing let's do is prevent the default. So let's prevent default. We'll pass the event object. And next, let's do var data equals uh, get request body. And then, just for the sake of testing, we will alert data. So let's make sure everything else is in place. I believe it is. So let's go to the browser. Let's refresh. And we have something bad happen because we are performing that Ajax request. We will comment out send so that will not send the request. Refresh and everything's good there. Okay, so name, let's do John Doe. For email, let's do john at doe.com. And whenever we click submit, we will see the text name equals John. And then we can see the space was encoded with the percent sign 20. That is the encoding for a space. And everything else looks fine. The button submit doesn't have anything there. Uh, we can set the value. Let's go ahead and do that. Value equals btn submit. That unfortunately changes the name of our submit button, but we can actually do this. Submit. That way we have a value for submit and it is somewhat readable. So let's go ahead and re-input that information. So John Doe and then John at doe.com. Whenever we click submit, then we can see that we are sending a value for the submit button as well. So there we go. Our get request body method or function is working great. All we have to do now is make our Ajax request inside of our submit event handler and send the data along with that request. So let's uncomment our send, let's copy or cut and paste all of this code inside of our event handler. We'll make things just a little bit prettier by tabbing over. And now we need to send the data. Now there is a header that we do need to send along with our request so that the browser knows what to do with the data that we are sending. To do that, we use a method called set request header. It has two arguments. The first is the header that we want to set. In this case, it's content type. And then the second argument is the value for that header. In this particular case, we want to use application slash x dash www slash form slash URL encoded. This is going to tell the this web server that we are sending you data in the format that you normally get when someone submits a form. That's what this content type is saying. And you can call the set request header basically anywhere that you want to, as long as you do so before you call the send method, because it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to send the request and then set your headers. You need to set the headers so that they are sent along with the request. So everything looks okay. Let's save this. I really don't expect this to work primarily because we are trying to post to a text file and IIS typically doesn't like that. But let's do John Doe. Let's do John at doe.com. And then whenever we submit, we see that something bad happened. Well, what happened? Let's remove the text of something bad happened. And let's just do response text because that should contain at least some information from the server. So let's refresh and let's do John Doe again, john at doe.com. And <laughs> yes, we got a whole lot more information, but this is basically telling us that we are trying to do something that IIS isn't going to allow us to do. That is submit a post request to a text file. And in fact, I think that's, uh, status of 405. So if we alert status, go back and enter in all this wonderful stuff, but we're not going to do that. Just submit. We can see, yeah, we're getting a 405, which is IIS's way of saying you can't do that. 
And we'll stop here for today. This was a crash course in Ajax. There's many other topics that fit under the umbrella of Ajax, but this is the basis. This is the foundation needed to do just about everything as far as Ajax is concerned. And you've probably noticed all the code that you have to write in order to write asynchronous uh, JavaScript requests. And that's just the nature of the beast. We were given the XML HTTP request object, and that's what we're stuck with for the time being. But you can kind of see why there are so many JavaScript libraries available today, because many of them started off as Ajax libraries, making Ajax easier to use. So in the next lesson, we are going to talk about a data format called JSON. And we will see how we can use it with Ajax, but then we will also look at uh, how we can store data within the browser using JSON as well. And, and then that will be in another lesson. So with that, have a good one. I will see you next time. Take care.